listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. Um, the young lady next to Hunter, what, what's your name? Lindsay. During worship, Lindsay, I saw you... Um, like I saw you coming out of this darkness and you were like worshiping and dancing and I saw what looked to be like handcuffs that had fallen off of you and they were laying on the ground and like there's been such a, you, you've gone through such a dark season but you've been willing to face it and the Lord's been with you. And then I saw all this creativity explode in your life. I, it, was, it was almost like I saw you like in a studio of some sort, like a dance studio or something and you were just exploding with worship and creativity and I just want you to know that the Lord sees what you've overcome. He's with you, and he's so proud of you. Bless you. So, I came under one of the worst attacks yesterday that I've had in forever. Thank you. And, uh, and normally, when that happens, the day before we gather, it, it like ends up being really good. But I really felt after pondering this and the demon told me he was going to kill me, I was like, well, you need to line up. And, uh, but it, it was really intense and uh, my vision started blurring and I started getting like kaleidoscope vision and panicky and, and I knew what was going on. I was rebuking it and it took forever to break. But literally it says, I heard the thoughts, I'm going to kill you. And I'm like, no, you're not. Like, I would have been dead a long time ago. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, I'm not schizophrenic. I don't hear voices. When you do hear a voice other than God's and yours, that's a demon. So there's 101. But one of the biggest shifts in the body of Christ right now is the issue of the Great Commission. Um, a couple of, probably three months ago, remember when I taught on prophetic evangelism, for those of you that were here? There's been a real fire. In fact, one of the pillars of cross-kingdom culture is outreach, right? It is, and unfortunately, the American church has grown extremely dull when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission. And I, uh, I couldn't get away from this. And last week, I said some things, and I don't know how many of y'all wa- have watched uh, Sheep Among Wolves. We got a few, I know Troy's watched it probably nine or ten times now, but seven, eight, and, uh, but listen, y'all, the fastest growing church, the body of Christ, the fastest growing place right now is Iran. They're the fastest growing, and guess what? In principle, they're not doing anything new in principle, but they've cut all the religious crap out, and they've gone back to the basics, the foundation, they've gone back to Acts, they've gone back to what Jesus said, and they've kept the simplicity of the gospel, and they're, they're not building things based on denominations, they're not building things based on personalities, they're not building things on programs, they're actually... I'm so full right now, I, I could like rabbit trail a hundred different places. I want to read you something from one of the guys that's a trainer. And, I, and this is, there's a little bit here, but just close your eyes and listen to this. I, I really believe that God wants to shift, completely shift the way we do discipleship in this nation. And when I say shift it, I mean literally kill what we were doing and, and realign and actually do what we're supposed to be doing. I know that's a strong statement, but when I'm finished, if you don't agree with me, you still have to love me. All right. So what if I told you that disciple-making movements have spread across the world, leading to thousands of churches being planted, hundreds of thousands of people being saved? And the transformation of whole Muslim communities and mosques to faith in Christ. What if I told you that movement was launched by the simple application of disciple-making methods of Jesus 
with the result that God is creating a remarkable and unprecedented uh, momentum of ministry in some of the least expected places in the Islamic world. A ministry that looks a lot like a continuation of the book of Acts. A spirit-filled Christian could hardly contain his enthusiasm to learn to apply these biblical methods and join the harvest of souls. I, I, I want to set this up because last, um, last Sunday when I spoke, I'd mentioned some things about treating, treating the lost like they were already saved and actually beginning to disciple them and, until they actually convert. And, um, and I, I said a few other things, I guess, that after watching the documentary made sense. I talked with Rich. Rich has got a buddy who's planted nine churches in the United States, or, okay, yeah, he's planted nine churches in the United States, and Rich was telling me this before he, he had watched this documentary, and we were talking, and he's like, listen, he goes, my buddy said the, the Western church has it totally wrong, the way that they're discipling, and he goes, we're supposed to be discipling the lost, so what do we do in the Western church? We get people saved, and then we start discipling them. We do the opposite. Jesus didn't do that. Y'all, the disciples weren't saved when Jesus, when they started following Jesus. Do you understand that? Thomas, at the very end, was like, I still don't believe you. He's standing in front of them for crying out loud. After three years of ministry, after multiplying food, walking through people, raising the dead, and Thomas was like, I won't believe unless I put my hand in his side. And we are dealing with, with a, a culture of massive unbelief and that is scared to death of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not tame. The Holy Spirit doesn't care about your agendas. Whew. We have got to stop playing church. Do, if, do we even have a clue the hour in history that we're in? And if you haven't looked, people aren't dying to come into these buildings anymore. It, it, we, have a, we have a culture that is not churched. We have people in the United States that literally have never heard the name Jesus before. We have, for the first time in history, other nations bringing missionaries to the United States to wake them up. Like, we need a... We need an awakening. I understand revival precedes awakening, but we must be awakened. The church is asleep. We, are, we have a slumbering spirit over the church. Do you recognize that when, when um, the parable of the virgins, all ten of them, right? Five were wise, five were foolish. Five had oil, five didn't have oil. But when he came at the midnight cry, they were all asleep. Why do you think Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith? He's asking this question over and over in the book of Revelation. It says, and here is the perseverance of the saints. And here is the perseverance of the saints. There, there's literally people, there were some Iranians in that documentary. They moved to the United States and they, they were here for a couple of years. And the wife was miserable here. And she says, I want to go back to Iran. She was like, there's a demolic a demonic lullaby being sung over this nation, over the church, and I'm feeling sleepy. Listen, I'm not saying it's wrong t for us to prosper, to have prosperity, but if prosperity kills your fire and your love for Jesus, there's a problem. Prosperity can be dangerous because you can forget why you need him. In Deuteronomy, when he says, I'm going to give you this, this, and this, and this, today I lay before you a blessing and a cursing, he says all of these things, and he says, lest you forget me when you're blessed. And the American church has forgotten Jesus. I know this is tough, but... So there's missions methodology that has caught the imagination of sending agencies, churches, and... And mission candidates <clears throat> throughout the world, <laughs> the influence of this movement 
among sending organizations supporting the, this methodology seems nearly ambiguous. The mission's methodology is called Disciple Making Movement, or DMM. It's believed that DNF, or DMM is a recapturing of the mythology of Jesus and the apostles. According to DMM, proponents, the traditional models of church planting and discipleship are methods built upon denominational doctrines and traditions which are foreign to how Jesus did discipleship. Perhaps the earliest practitioner and trainer of DMM, David Watson, wrote, God taught me through many failures that I had to focus on making disciples of Christ, not followers of my church or denomination. He's also taught me that I needed to teach these disciples to obey the commands of Jesus, not my church or my denominational doctrines or traditions. This is what led to the breakthrough that resulted in more than 80,000 churches among a people considered unreachable. Like, we live in a nation right now. I can get here on live stream, and I, I could start saying the most craziest things. And even though the CIA probably is watching, <laughs> but no one's going to come busting through this door. When I, when I preached in Egypt, the very first session was I was preaching, and I had the translator, and I was scared to death because this place is crazy, and it's not here. Like, you actually risk your life there and a car bomb went off I thought I was dead I'm not kidding you like I thought oh crap they found me and I'm gonna die at 40 years old I was like Jesus I'm not gonna die am I and I'm literally having these thoughts and there's 110 pastors and and the pastors in the front row start laughing at me they're literally laughing at me it's okay keep going now, that's a different culture, y'all. That's a different culture. There's something that the American church has not tasted of, and it's called the sufferings of Christ. Paul made the statement, I'm filling up in my body the lack, what's lacking in the body for the sufferings of Christ. Watson does not seem to believe he's a pioneer of a new methodology, but rather a man whom the Lord led back to the practices of the New Testament. He has reported that his rediscovery of these methods led to millions of people being saved and thousands of churches being planted in what is previously considered the hard soil of Muslim people. Right now, there's a, there's a, a revival taking place in downtown New Orleans in a bar. And it's called the Bourbon Street Revival. The owners of this bar are not saved. They didn't start this bar to evangelize. It's a straight up bar. People are going in there to get tore up from the feet up. And, but this worship leader and some people found favor to go in there. And literally the presence of God is falling on this place. And these people are getting, they're having encounters with God, and they're giving their lives to the Lord. And, it, and it's literally, every, like, twice a month they're going there. And they schedule, and they play for hours. And this, this guy has been ridiculed and, and hammered by the religious because how dare he go do that? I thought it was funny that Kalen said, who, who were the greatest evangelists, Right? The demoniac, which, by the way, y'all, one of the Gospels actually says there were two legions. There were actually two guys, not just one, right? Just like there were two cults and not just one. One of the Gospels actually shares that. And he ends up being one of the greatest evangelists ever. He says, no, stay here. The, they're growing the church. In fact, in Charisma Magazine last week, the... the um, the government of Iran is getting scared to death because of this movement of the body of Christ. But guess what? If you love your life, you won't do what they're doing. Right? How do we overcome? By what? The word of our testimony, the blood of the lamb, and loving not our lives even unto death. In Hebrews, it says that people would literally refuse to be let go so that they would obtain to a better resurrection. 
and half the time we can't get past our 401k. We think we've lost the favor of God if we prayed for a parking spot and somebody else took it. <sighs> I mean, I have prayed for parking spots. I'm just being honest. Listen, I think, I think that this nation is called to be a lighthouse in the last days. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with prosperity. Solomon was the richest man on the earth. But how do we steward the blessing of God and not let it put out the fire of God? Because that's the dilemma in America. If you want to read what, ch what prophetic church we fall in from Revelation, we're the church of Laodicea. That was good. So now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, we could sit here and argue for days. How far are we at the end of the age? Joel 2, which begin in Acts 2, we're literally living in that fulfillment of Acts 2 right now. We're still in the fulfillment. The Holy Spirit is being poured out on all flesh. That means all those lost people that we sit and judge and, and condemn all the times, God's pouring out His Spirit on them so that His children will get in there and actually be light and be salt, love them, treat them the way Jesus treats us, and all of a sudden, they see this love that's among us and because we're pulling them in, we're having relationship with them, we're, teach it, we're treating them like they're already believers, we're discipling them, we might even be empowering them before they know Jesus, and it's messy, but it's Jesus. This is the way he discipled. He didn't wait until they said the prayer of confession. Jesus' way of doing evangelism was, hey, you want to follow me? Sell everything you got, let's go. Or, hey, I'll make you fishers of men, drop your nets, let's go. He didn't sit there for 30 minutes and sing kumbaya and get an emotional response out of people, which then they come to the front, they say a prayer, they go out, they live like hell, and their trust is in a prayer and it's not in Jesus, and therefore there's never transformation in their life. That is not the gospel. The gospel is it costs you everything, but you gain everything in return. I have allowed so much church crap to rob my fire for the lost over the, over the last couple of years, and I'm done. Y'all, we, we have got to grow up. We absolutely have got to grow up. And it's like when, in, in Hebrews, when he said, listen, you should be eating meat by now, and you're still on the bottle. It says, to much is given, much is required. Do you understand the amount of knowledge we have in this room? If you never read your Bible ever again, and you just focused on the head knowledge becoming experiential knowledge, it would take you more than a lifetime. Your issue is not having more knowledge of God. It's being intimate with him so it transforms you. So then you can see other people transformed around you. Shut up, Siri. Listen, every day, this is, this is literally lifestyle. Like, what, what if it gets so ingrained into our DNA that we are actually just treating everyone the same? What, what, if, what if we choose not to love some in this beautiful place, and then all of a sudden we shut our love off over here because they ticked us off? What if we choose to keep loving everyone equally, Keep seeing everyone the way God created them. I don't care how lost they are, how much darkness they're in. What, what, if, what if you actually had the eyes of heaven and you looked at everyone and you saw them from God's perspective and you actually saw them from what Jesus is trying to show them and it's not their sin. Their sin is in the way of who they are. 
When he said it's finished, it's finished. We have to be focused on the gold and their identity. If all you do is focus on sin, you'll keep sinning. But if you turn your eyes to the author and finisher of your faith, and all of a sudden now you're pulling identity from him, you've just shifted your focus, and now your faith is directed in the right location. Now this is important because this is huge. We live in a day where greasy grace or hyper grace is flooding into the church and they're saying you don't need to repent of your sin after you know Jesus and they're watering down the gospel. They're absolutely taking the power of the gospel out. And, and, and it's, it, that road, I promise you, that road leads to universalism. It's unsanctified mercy. It's not the love of God. And so at the core of this is obedience-based discipleship, OBD. OBD is at the heart of DMM. The goal of missions work is to fulfill the Great Commission and make disciples of all nations. OBD is definitional to what DMM proponents uh, believe in the nature of discipleship. Jesus made clear that essential to making disciples is to teach them to what? Obey, not just hear. The Hebrew word for hear literally means obey. So if you say, I hear you, and then you go do something opposite, you know you did not hear them. The Hebrew word for, uh, for hear literally means obey. And, it, and at the very nature of the Great Commission is teaching them to obey all that I've taught them or that I've taught you. Obedience is at the heartbeat of the Great Commission. We can't say we love him and then walk in darkness. First John says, then you're a liar and you don't walk in the truth. Like this is the hard stuff, y'all that we need to hear in love, not condemnation, but we don't hear about this stuff anymore. And, and we want everyone to tickle our ears. Like, you can get so lost in church planning with having the right lights and having the right equipment and doing all this stuff. Get over it. You've got, a na- you've got a, an earth that's dying and going to hell. You've got people that walk for hours to go sit in a beat-up building with dirt and plastic chairs because they love God. And they don't care how long they're there. They don't care how many hours it takes to walk home. And we can't even get people to come on time in a vehicle. Like this stuff is, I, I'm, hear my heart, please. I'm not condemning. Like we have got to change the way we're doing things. I'm not in the office of an evangelist, but I feel like one today. <laughs> Which, by the way, on that note, you're still accountable individually to make disciples, whether you're in the office of an evangelist or not. How can you fall in love with Jesus and he transforms your life and you not want everyone around you to know about it? It says, where the, where the, uh, where the manger's empty... Well, hold on, I'm screwing the proverb up. Time out. Much increase comes by the ox, right? But guess what? When the ox is out of the, out of the stall, the stall's clean. But much increase comes by the ox. What is that proverb saying? Solomon's saying, if you want increase, you've got to shovel poo. That's true. All right. We have to stop being afraid of empowering people and letting them fulfill what God put them on this planet for. Every single person in this room was born at this time in history intentionally because God designed you to touch people and to change things that nobody else on this earth can touch and change the way each of you individually can. And every one of you are an individual expression of the part of the very nature of God. So you should not be ashamed of who you are. Stop rejecting yourself and let yourself radiate the nature of God. Each one of you are divine partakers of his nature. This is identity. It's God has changed me. I don't need your approval, but I will love you. If you don't like me, that's your problem, not mine, because I can't be rejected because he didn't reject me. No, it's not because of all the coffee I've had this morning. I do believe there'll be coffee in heaven, though. Hebrews. Yep. 
I have plenty of those cheesy ones. I will spare you and keep going. No more rabbits. So Jesus, <laughs> Jesus made clear. Evidently, Surrey loves me a lot this morning. Oh, I didn't mean to say your name. <laughs> Jesus made clear that essential to making disciples is teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And DMM, the disciple maker, is given the role of helping the unbelieving disciple obey the commands of scriptures daily. Did you catch that? Let me say that again. The in DMM, the disciple maker is given the role of helping the unbelieving disciple obey the commands of Scripture daily. And he moves towards conversion to faith in Christ. See, evangelism is not a one-time event. It's a process. And the greatest form is friendship evangelism with the lost, treat treating them like they're saved until they become saved. After he has come to faith in Christ, he is baptized and incorporated into the church body. Uh, Truesdale lays this out clearly. Disciple makers are prepared to invest weeks, months, and maybe years developing genuine friendships. Y'all, we can't even get people to come to a family fellowship night. And they're all believers. Which that is growing. I don't, don't let me. But my point is, in, in Acts, in the beginning, I got to be careful. I get a lot of emails. I'm so fired up. They couldn't get enough of each other. The result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a supernatural love that was poured out into every believer that they met daily and broke bread because that's how they loved each other. And it was that love that transformed the world. Disciple makers are prepared to invest weeks, months, and maybe years developing genuine friendships, facilitating someone's discovery of and obedience to God's story from creation to Christ, and eventually giving Jesus his life allegiance. In this documentary, there's this girl. She's an atheist. She's a Muslim. They've got all their faces blurred and their, and their voices uh, mumbled and all that. And she, de she had attempted suicide multiple times with pills and everything, was not dead yet. She decides that she's going to commit suicide. She takes a ton of pills, takes a rope, a noose, puts it around her neck, and the last thing she says before she jumps off to kill herself is, God, if you're real, hold me. And boom, she jumps. And she said about four seconds later, all of a sudden, Jesus was in front of her. Do you understand that there are Muslims by the groves coming to know the Lord Jesus right now through visions and dreams and visitations. And he's bypassing so many people because of their, pro their programs and their religiosity. He's bypassing them and he's going, if my people won't love enough to go in there, I'll go in myself. And people are literally being converted with visions and dreams. And Jesus is in front of her. And all of a sudden, he's got her on his shoulders and when she comes out of this encounter, she's laying on a bed and the noose is on the floor. This is the God you serve. It is. And he's doing these things all over the earth. And, and just because you personally may not see the, the miracle signs and wonders to that intensity in your life does not mean it's not real, that it does not exist. When, when we have taken the American church and said, Holy Spirit's not doing what he was doing then. He stopped. We don't need it. We've taken the power of God out. In John 20, Jesus breathed on the disciples. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit in John 20 in that moment. But he says, wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you for the empowerment of ministry. You see that in Acts 1. Acts 2 comes, tongues of fire, and they change the world. It wasn't because of what was in and of themselves that they changed the world. It was because they recognized apart from Jesus, they could do nothing. John 5, I can do nothing apart from my father, period. The son can do nothing of himself, but only what the father shows him. And so we got to recognize and adopt that. That us, we can do nothing without Jesus. And then when we're abiding in him, we're radiating, radiating him and radiating the father. Can you grab me a couple batteries out of there? And we're radiating the father. And then the world sees our good works and glorifies our Father in heaven. Bear with me one sec, y'all. Can you hear me now? Check. 
test us. Okay, there we go. So, man, I only have a couple minutes left. Listen, the church today is preaching to produce conversion, then teaching to increase knowledge, then giving periodic attention, usually in sermons, to encourage converts to obey what they've learned. Jesus' strategy was very different. What Jesus did with the 12 was exactly opposite. He discipled them to conversion. He selected the 12 and spent more than three years with them. They went where he went, asking questions, watching what he did, doing it with him, and then doing it by themselves, being coached and mentored to be obedient disciples. Do you recognize Jesus, uh, Peter, they come back and they want to call fire down from heaven, y'all. Like, they're not what we, like, we would not release them today. We would send them back to Bible college. We would send them through Sozo about four more years. And then if we saw any signs of sin, we'll say, oh, you're, you're almost there. You're almost ready to pastor a church. You're almost ready to do this. And Jesus takes these ragamuffin fishermen and he starts discipling them. He empowers them, gives them authority over all demons, all diseases. They want to burn down an entire city and kill everyone. And he goes, you don't know what spirit you're of. Hey, you 70, come here. Boom. And it says nothing about that 70 actually knowing him or not. He empowered them. Oh, this is so in your face to what we've been doing. But they've got fruit. Where's our fruit? Our, there's so many statistics right now, y'all. Our fruit is dwindling, and they're exploding. And, and they didn't come up with some move, new move of God, redoing church totally different than no generation on the earth has ever seen. They went back to the simplicity of the gospel. They changed the way they were doing the Great Commission, and now they're experiencing an awakening in this land like never before in history. That was good. And then one day, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Matthew 16, 15. All those years, Jesus was revealing himself to the 12. He brought them to the point of not knowing him to the point where they did discover who he really was and were ready to follow him anywhere, even to death for him. This model of disciple making that Jesus, this is the model he gave us. Listen, as we study the encounters of Jesus, uh, Jesus had with non-believers or even his disciples for that matter, you'll be shocked to see how different it is compared to today's evangelism. We're doing, we're doing God an injustice when we take a track and give them to somebody that doesn't know the Lord and saying, you're dying and going to hell, read this, and you walk off. Like, have we really gone, have we gotten to the point where we're so impersonal that we don't want relationships with people that will shout from the, the corner of a, with a bullhorn and just yell and condemn at everybody and then wonder why no one's getting converted. You're the track. You're the one that's supposed to pour your life out into people. They can read you. You're the Bible they're going to see. Are you with me? Like, do you, do, I mean, look around at the condition of the American church and we have got to wake up. We have got to get back to how, literally how Jesus taught us to do things. We, we've literally had people stop coming to our church because of how real and raw our community is. And it was too much for them. And so they went back to their places so they could hide. We don't want to hide. Everybody, we need to... We need to cherish each other and cherish each other's process that we're in. Everybody's in a process right now. Everyone's going from glory to glory. And guess what? There may be people in this room right now that have junk in their trunk. But you didn't know them five years ago when they had a truckload of junk in their trunk. Now they just got a Honda Accord of stuff. <laughs> and, and if you judge them based on the moment they're in, not having a flipping clue what they came out of, you pass judgment on them. And with the measure you use, it's measured back. <laughs> Let 
In John 14, 6, which is one of the most quoted scriptures many times for evangelism, in context had nothing to do with the lost. Jesus was speaking to Thomas and his disciples long after they'd already been following him. We, we never see Jesus or his disciples getting people to make a decision and pray a prayer of salvation. Decision-based evangelism has been made popular just in the past century. That's not what he did. So we're judging the quality or the growth of the American church based on prayers that were said by people that you may never see ever again in your life. And then we wonder why people are not being transformed. Listen, I came out of the Baptist movement. I got saved every time uh, revival came. Yeah, Rich was Baptist too. I got baptized so many times, I know the tadpoles by their first name. <laughs> oh, you'll give me that one? Okay. So, recovering our relevance and culture. So, in other words, you never change the message, but you have to understand how to reach different cultures. Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might, what, save some. It means you're willing to risk your neck with the religious and go into places like Bourbon Street. It means you're willing to go to New Orleans and set up a booth and do dream interpretation and spiritual readings because those are actually prophetic words and the New Agers just don't know they're about to get uh, blasted by the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, you stir up a hornet's nest of the religious. When I was doing prophetic evangelism out in Wharton's Dock, outside of Bandera, I had this encounter with this religious spirit two weeks before all hell broke loose and came against me and the pastors and we were doing treasure hunts and going through that area. It's 3,000 people. The meth is so bad, trailers are burning down in there all the time from meth labs. And, and it, I mean, there were, people were spreading rumors in Bandera. Churches were spreading rumors about me. They'd never sat down and ever had a meal with me or a cup of coffee. They had no idea who I was. But they were scared to death of what was happening. And so they started blasting us and and we did an outreach. Tim Tom, uh, Thomason with Nature Blinds, he came and helped feed all these people. We loved on them. We fed them. We gave them clothes. And, and, and we, we had all this stuff set up. And there were rumors that we had se a seance tent. <laughs> that the church was going to have a seance tent. And one of the pastors stood up right in front of me. It was the most testing day of my life. And he sat there and... and his elders said, he just moved there. His elders told him, you either back off or you're fired. So he came, and he told all the other pastors, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, everything I was doing was unbiblical. And, and blasted me to them right in front of me. I was right next to him. I was like, Jesus, I know this is a test. And I stood there as this guy ridiculed what I was doing. I stayed calm, and I said, listen. I said, if anyone else thinks that what I'm teaching is not biblical... Now's the time for you to go. And I just stayed at peace. I looked at him. I said, I bless you. I love you. I thank you for being with us. And I bless you to go back. And that's what I said. And right around that time, I had this encounter with this huge white lion in this dream. And he, and he started circling me. I was in a hospital, and there was this nurse. And she speaks audibly to me. She goes, oh, don't worry. He won't hurt you. And this white lion, which represented a religious spirit, looks at me, and he speaks audibly to me in the encounter. And he says, I've been waiting for this. And he stands up on his hind end legs and puts his paws on my shoulders. And I fly out of this encounter and fly up in bed, which I have a tendency to do. I don't know where my wife is, but I've scared her a few times. And literally, all hell broke loose. And the next year, I called all the pastors. I said, who's with me? Let's go back. None. None of them would go. If we're willing to allow the enemy to intimidate us and then not go back, who's seen Hacksaw Ridge, the Mel Gibson's new movie? We, we watched that last night, and I'm literally in tears. You ever watch movies where God starts talking to you in the movies? And, and I'm literally just, I'm, I'm like in tears. This dude saves all these people. 75 p wounded soldiers he saves. He stays up on this ridge by himself. 
And he kept saying, one more. Just one more. And what if that was the cry of our heart? Just one more soul, Lord. Just one more. We get somebody in the kingdom. One more. One more. One more. And he literally, he's lowering them down. His hands are bleeding. You know, it says, you've not yet resisted sin unto death, to, or unto blood. And he's sitting there, and he's lowering these guys down, his made-up rope, and he's lowering them and lowering them. And, and there's literally, his hands are raw from lowering 75 men overnight that all, like almost all of them lived, and they would have died up there had he not stayed up there. And he didn't even have a rifle, y'all. He was, he was running right into the enemy's face, and he didn't even have a rifle. This is exactly what we have to do when Paul says be a good soldier. We have to have the mindset that this, this life is a vapor. It's fleeting. It says store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and thief, it, it won't rust, it won't corrupt, it can't be stolen. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to ask you this morning, where are your treasures? Where are your treasures? When Paul wrote about the joy of the Lord, he was in a pit. He was in the mud. He had nothing. He was sitting in his own feces and urine, and he's writing about the joy of the Lord, and it's his strength. Where are your treasures this morning? It's not about us getting more stuff here. It's about us being transformed from the kingdom. You have, this is, the, your legacy is being lived right now. In this very moment, we have one life. Your legacy is being lived now. What kind of legacy do you want to leave for your children? What is your spiritual inheritance that you're going to leave for them? They're not looking for perfection from you, parents. They're just looking for real, authentic, radical love. And when you stumble, you get back up. When you lose your temper, you ask them to forgive you. They're looking for real relationship. Exactly what Jesus had with the disciples. He never condemned them. My goodness, when Adam fell, they hid. They were convinced the father was going to kill him. They were convinced. And the father comes in, and what's he do? Genesis 3.15 is the very first prophecy about Jesus showing up. His answer was redemption. He refused to allow sin to, re to steal what he created. Okay. Prayer teams. Prayer team. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.